Today the topic will be urinary infections and resistance to antibiotics. I think UTI is important for some reasons. Uh, one of them is that UTI, urinary tract infections, are frequent. Almost every woman experiences at least one episode of urinary tract infection. On the other hand, on a nosocomial level, urinary tract infections are the most important or most frequent causes of nosocomial infections and most frequent causes of nosocomial bacteremia. They cause considerable mor morbidity. Uh, any patient who has the symptoms of at least acute urinary cystitis suffers for six years. The good news is that these infections respond to appropriate treatment. But what about resistance? If the microorganisms develop resistance, then can they be treatable easily? So this is the topic. We will discuss the uh, increasing resistance to antibiotics in urology. So the outline of my talk will be like this. I will underline the significance of resistance in urinary tract infections. Then I'd like to discuss some data from recent most important surveys. And we have been conducting a survey within the European section for infections in urology, which is now called Global Prevalence Study of Infections in Urology. I would like to share with you some data, some information about our publications. Another important aspect of urological urinary tract infections is that we are seeing more and more, more and more ESPL positive microorganisms in the isolated in urinary tract infections. So I would like to discuss that topic too. And finally, probably together we will reach some conclusions. Now urinary tract infections are among the most prevalent infections as I mentioned earlier. Probably I should stay over there. And increasing antimicrobial resistance is a major concern for some reasons. Because most of the community acquired infections are treated on an empirical basis. We prescribe any antibiotic thinking that it's going to be efficient. But if there is resistance to that antibiotic and if we are not aware of it, then we, are, we won't be successful. Also for nosocomial, treatment of nosocomial infections, we have the same problems. And resistance levels to nosocomial infections are much higher than community acquired infections. So these two items are significant reasons for the, indicating the importance of resistance. And how can we get information about this? We should either perform or be aware of surveillance programs so that we get, we, we get some valuable information about resistance patterns. In the past there have been some important uh, studies which were recently published. One of them was EcoSense project. Uh, the only author or investigator was Gunnar Kalmeter. He recruited patients with symptoms of acute urinary tract infections. These patients were women under the age of 65. Adult women under the age of 65. He recruited more than 4,700 women. Uh, these patients were registered in six, 16 different countries from more than 250 healthcare centers. And he, together with the team, looked at the susceptibility of uropathogens to 12 different antimicrobial agents. So he got these results. Sorry. He found out that for certain antibiotics, the resistance rates are very high. For example, for ampicillin, for sulfamethoxazole, the resistance, although it's varying between low number figures and high figures, on average, the resistance is very high. However, for nitrofurantoin, phosphomycin, and metzilinam, the resistance levels were low. I don't know if you have metzilinam here, because it's mostly marketed in nor northern European countries, but I think you have phosphomycin and nitrofurantoin, and they've been in the market for long years. However, the resistance rates are not still too high. This is an interesting finding. Following this study, Kurt Naber and his team performed another study. In this one, countries were mostly from Europe, but there is Brazil also included. This study was called Surveillance Study in Europe and Brazil on Clinical Aspects and Antimicrobial Resistance Epidemiology in Females with Cystitis. Very similar, similar study style with EcoSense. Uh, this study was performed between 2003 and 6. Almost similar amount of, similar number of female patients were recruited. They were also under the age of 16. Again, pathogens were identified and susceptibility tests were performed. This time not to 12, but nine antimicrobial agents. 
Pilot study, in the conclusion, compared its results with EcoSense study because it was the only study published until then. And show, they showed that, Kurt Naber and his team showed that, there was an increasing figure of resistance of E. coli to amphicillin, trimethoprim, malidixic acid, and ciprofloxacin. There was only a time difference of two or three years between EcoSense and Rx. So this increase was significant. Another significant imp uh, finding was emergence of ciprofloxacin resistance in Austria. Because in countries like Turkey, Greece, maybe in Bulgaria, you can get the antibiotics over the counter. But in Austria, you can get it only with prescription. So you, one would think that use of antibiotics would be very sensible and reasonable in, in a country like Austria, but probably because of traveling people and for other reasons, there was an emergence of ciprofloxacin resistance in Austria. This was an important finding. There is another study, ongoing study, which is called European Antimicrobial Resistance Survey. This is mostly for uh, hospital-acquired or healthcare-acquired infections. And when we look at the resistance of E. coli to some, to some several, to some uh, an, um, antibiotics, resistance to third generation cephalosporins is the highest. Wherever I go, I would say Turkey is leading, but not Turkey and Bulgaria are leading countries. The red uh, is about between 25 to 50%. The resistance of E. coli to fluoroquinolones is also similar in Turkey and Bulgaria, although Turkey is leading this time because it's got the highest rate of resistance. More than 50% of isolates are resistant to fluoroquinolones in our country, and we are still prescribing fluoroquinolones without any uh, antimicrobial testing. How about aminoglucosides? Once again, Turkey and Bulgaria are sharing the leadership. And when we look at the northern countries like Scandinavia, the resistance rates are very low. There are reasons for this. Maybe we will discuss this later. But we know that resistance issue is an important issue in the Mediterranean area today, together with the Balkans. After some time, Karl Meter performed another study, like the EcoSense. He, uh, he called this EcoSense Revisited. The first one was performed between 1999 and 2000, and the other one it was almost seven years later. The number of urine samples are lower than the first study, but E. coli was the leading causative organism, and the resistance of E. coli to antimicrobials was tested again. There was an increase in nalidixic acid, resistance to nalidixic acid. The others look similar because of this variation. One cannot say if this is higher or low. And resistance to methicillinum, phosphomycin, and nitrofurantoin was still low. But one important finding was that in the first study, there was no isolates which were, resistant, which were producing ESPR. But in the second one, they detected 11 isolates. I think this is an important finding uh, underlining the risk of ESPR positive infections. So his important remarks were like this. First of all, it's not so easy to perform a uh, survey in this design because normally, in general, the patients with uncomplicated cystitis or uncomplicated urinary tract infections don't get a urinary culture. We don't culture the patients. We just prescribe on an empirical basis. So when you ask inf investigators, please, when you have a patient, have the susceptibility test and give the results to me, it's, it's difficult. But he was able to do that. So he wants to underline that these were the culture results from uncomplicated patients, which is unusual. He also noticed that there is a cross resistance between nalidixic acid and ciprofloxacin. And of the isolates which were resistant to ampicillin, they were almost all of them are, were resistant to ciprofloxacin. And associated resistance with the use of many drugs increases selective pressure for other antimicrobials. This cross resistance problem is an important issue. I know that we have uh, distinguished colleagues from the Department of Microbiology. Maybe we will discuss, or they, they know better about these issues, but, but when we discuss, we should mention these issues too. <coughs> then come our studies. We started in 2003 as a pan-European prevalence study, one-day prevalence study. The next year, we changed the title to pan-Euro-Asian, because we accepted countries from Asia. This is a one-day prevalence study, mostly in one of the weekdays of November. Sometimes we extended it to December, but we generally preferred November. And we said that because of the description of nosocomial in, in, uh, UTIs, the patient has to be in the clinic for 48 hours. So the first day and the last day of the week will not be suitable. So we accepted 
the, the days as Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. All inpatients in urology clinics were screened and if they developed an infection they were reported. So these infections were either microbiologically diagnosed or uh, clinically diagnosed. And features of the patients and hospitals were also recorded. Is it a teaching hospital? Is it a university hospital? Is it a district hospital? What about the site? And so on. Sometimes we also perform site studies. One of the latest site studies was about the infective complications of prostate biopsy. Sometimes we looked at other issues like catheter-associated infections, TURP, and so on. This is one of our recent publications. In, we included the first eight years of the studies for statistical reasons. So almost 20,000 urological patients were screened during the study days. Out of these, 9.4 of them had nosocomial infections. These were either microbiologically diagnosed or clinically. There were positive urine cultures in almost 1,400 of them. And the pathogens were E. coli being the most frequent, followed by Enterococcus, Pseudomonas, and Klebsiella, almost equal, around 10%. When we looked at the resistance rates, this wasn't a nice, we didn't find a nice result because if you select 20% for the use of empirical prescription of an antibiotic, you cannot prescribe any of these. You cannot prescribe ciprofloxacin on an empirical basis, trimetoprim, sulfamethoxazol, antimetoprim, and so on. This is for all pathogens, and this is for E. coli. If you look at all pathogens, you can only prescribe imipenem on an empirical basis. Otherwise, you have to wait until the culture results, and sometimes it's too late for starting the treatment. So this was a, this looks like a disaster. Resistance rates are very high all over the world. There are some details. For example, E. coli accounts for more than 50% of nosocomially acquired urinary tract infections in South Europe, Southern Europe, Southern countries, whereas it accounts only for only one third of nosocomially acquired in infections in Northern Europe. So there, there's a difference of microorganisms causing these infections. There was significantly higher resistance to ciprofloxacin, gentamicin, and cefuroxin, which in South Europe. And the resistance rate of pseudomonas aerosolic was higher in Asia. Remember, we had, we had uh, recruitments from Asia as well. Almost all pseudomonas aerosolic uh, were resistant to ciprofloxacin, which is probably due to high antibiotic consumption because antibiotic consumption is similar in Asia, like in uh, Mediterranean countries. We also noticed that, that there is a risk for development of ESPL strains. Now, when we talk about antibiotic resistance, may maybe we should talk about other countries as well. And antibiotic resistance and antibiotic consumption in Mexico looks similar to Mediterranean countries. There is a high resistance of E. coli to ampicillin, cotrimoxazole, and ciprofloxacin. And when you look at nosocomial E. coli resistance in Mexico, there is a very high rate of ELV, ESPL producing microorganisms. On the other hand, healthy people can also carry ESPL positive microorganisms and these ratios may be as high as 51% like in Thailand. It's not too high in, in Europe, but in Thailand, in Southeastern Asia, these rates are very high. And once the patient has a UTI in the medical history, these rates will be much higher. What is the reason? We just really don't know, but animals may carry in the environment there might be, even in the environment there might be ESPL positive microorganisms. So Oteo, the author of this paper, uh, stated that there are some certain risk factors for ESPL positivity. Contact with healthcare centers. If the patient has once been to a healthcare, to a healthcare center, that risk is higher. If the patient is staying in a long-term care facility, the gut carriage, rectal carriage, is uh, 40 times. And if the patient has a urinary catheter, the risk is also high. So he underlined the importance of initial antimicrobial therapy because the main significant predictor of mortality in these serious infections were, was found to be the inadequate initial antimicrobial therapy. Then here we come to the high levels of resistance and the need of 
empirical use of antibiotics. We have to start immediately, but we don't know the results. We, it, we need time to get the results, and the natural resistance rates are too high. So which antibiotic to select, we don't know. This is a paper from Turkey. My colleagues found out that apart from the previous factors which cause, which increase the risk of ESPL positivity, previous urological operation and quinolone or any cephalosporin use for any infection during the last three months. These are also risk factors for ESPL infections. This is another uh, big study from Turkey. They collected more than 16,000 samples of urine and out of these, 500 had 510 had UTI. E. coli was the most frequent infection. And both in complicated and uncomplicated UTIs, E. coli was the leading agent. ESBL positivity was different in uncomplicated and complicated UTIs. It was higher, as would one would expect, in complicated UTIs. And the difference was statistically significant. They also noticed that there is high resistance to other drugs. And Almost 40% of ESPL producing isolates are resistant to trimethoprim, ciprofloxacin, and gentamicin. And CTH and are the most common ESPL type harbored by uropathogenic E. coli strains. We will come to this in a minute later. And previous episodes would also naturally be a risk factor, use on beta-lactam antibiotics, and prostatic disease. Prostatic disease is also important. We will come to that issue in a minute. But we use a lot of fluoroquinones for the treatment of prostatic infections and sometimes to treat PSA, which is not correct, but we will come to that later, as I said. Now, ESPL positivity is increasing if you look at different uh, publications. For example, in Khalil Kalbo's study, this one increased in three years almost threefold. The percentages may not be too high, quite too high but this is from 0.47 to 1.7. And Azat, one, my colleague from Turkey, also reported that there is an increase from 2004 to 2007 both in both complicated and uncomplicated UTIs. So we decided to perform a study in Turkey, in Istanbul, uh, including four big centers, four big urology departments. Uh, we perform prostatic biopsy when the PSA is high or when we have a suspicion of prostate cancer. And most of the time, there is some uh, prophylactic antibiotic use. But we don't know if these patients are carrying ESPL or not. And when we give the prescription, routine prescription, the prescription may not be efficient. So our aim was to find out the prevalence of fecal carriage of ESPL in patients undergoing prostate biopsy. Also to look for risk factors. If they have this uh, ESPL positivity, what are the risk factors? And we would find out the association of fecal carriage with infectious complications. Because up to 5% of the patients undergoing prostatic virus have uh, high fever, bacteremia, and infectious complications. We also tried to find out the genetic subtyping of the microorganisms. And this was recently public, published in urology. Now, 400 male patients were recruited for the study. Uh, 63 of these patients had the first biopsy. Some of them were having the second or third biopsy, but 63% were having the first biopsy. And because we recruited patients from different centers, there was no restriction about the prophylaxis regimen. Some used fluoroquinolone, some used cephalosporin. We said that everything is okay. But from all patients, rectal culture was taken immediately before biopsy. And midstream urine was looked at two days before, three and 14 days after biopsy. And potential risk factors were assessed by the history, medical history taking and physical examination. Now, almost 20% of these patients, which look healthy, were colonized with ESPL positive enterobacteriaceae. And resistance to fluoroquinolones was almost 16%. So the resistance to was about 14%. And resistance to both of these antibiotics was about 12%. And all these resistant microorganisms were ESPL producers. Looking at the prophylactic regime, most of the patients received uh, fluoroquinolones. So 16% of the prophylaxis would be in vain, not useful. And 31% would receive cefuroxim acetyl. 
Now, when we looked at the follow-up urine cultures on day three, 13 percent was positive, but in 45 percent of patients there was UTI symptoms without without microbiological proof. And after two weeks, we couldn't look at all patients out of 40, 400. We had only 148, but there was no colonization on day 14. So in, within two weeks, they were they looked to be free of the microorganisms. And post biopsy third day, asymptomatic bacteria was present in 4 percent. This was uh, symptomatic urinary tract infection was 9.3, which was associated with fluoroquinolone use and diabetes mellitus. And out of these patients, only 5.5% develop urosepsis. They, they were also ESBL carriers. And all these ESBL producers were, were having CTX-M gene. So our comments, my colleague's comments was like this, recent fluoroquinolone consumption is an important risk factor for symptomatic urinary tract infection after prostate biopsy. Diabetes and fluoroquinolone, they are both associated with fecal carriage of ESBL, but we don't know the reason. We cannot explain it within the context of this study. And ESBL was seen in all patients developing urosepsis. Also associated urinary tract infection symptoms was uh, together with ESBL, but this needs to be confirmed. This, we couldn't find the, a statistically significant result within the design of our study. And all the SPL pathogens had this CTXM gene, which is responsible for rapid dissemination of resistivity, resistance. So my conclusions would be, bacterial susceptibility rates in uncomplicated UTI vary among countries. I, I showed you some results. I didn't go into details with our, with our GPIU studies, but we know that there are different ratios. However, certain antimicrobials preserve their activity against most uropathogens, but unfortunately we can use most of these for uncomplicated urinary tract infections. We cannot prescribe these for complicated infections. And routine use of certain antibiotics is questionable because the, increase, the rates of resistance are very high. For example, amoxicillin, we cannot use it in Turkey, probably you cannot use it in Bulgaria either. Sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim, this is, it's impossible to use them on an empirical basis. And Increasing rates of ESPL positive infections create major concern, particularly for patients undergoing prostate biopsy. Blagodaria.